Welcome to On Marketing, a show where we explore marketing's first principles, mental models, and my favorite, contrarian takes. My aim is not to tell you what to think, it's assisting you in improving how you think about marketing and life. It's November 3rd, 2023. I'm Jordan Ogren, a marketing strategist by day and a podcast host by night. Joining me today is Anthony Perry, a former pastor and now product marketing guru, formerly a director of product marketing and currently co-founder and partner at Fletch PMM, homepage messaging for early stage B2B horizontal startups. In our conversation, we discuss how marketing's role is to generate demand for the product and make sales easier, why effective positioning is crucial for effective marketing, how niching down and focusing on a specific segment can lead to better results, capability-based messaging and how the progression of outcomes is important in messaging, and finally, how context is key in understanding the target audience and crafting effective messaging. Ready to get in? Before we do, make sure to subscribe to the newsletter. That's where all these podcast insights are going, my other essays and such. So please click the link in the first line of the show notes to sign up for that. I am grateful for you to be along on that journey. Also, a reminder that if you're watching this on YouTube, you can listen to this as a podcast. And if you're listening to this as a podcast, you can go see my beautiful mug on YouTube. So whatever works best for you, please indulge in that format. And finally, the opinions shared in this podcast are individual views of the host and guests, not representing their employers or associated organizations. This content is intended for informational purposes and should not be considered professional marketing guidance. Listeners act on the information provided at their own risk. That's all for the legal department. I'll see you on the other side. What is marketing? What job should marketing get done in a company? Yep, so I would say marketing's role is to generate demand for the product from the target segments that would be most beneficial to acquire. And so no matter what type of company you're in, if marketing is doing its job, the sales calls should be really easy. People mm -hmm. should come on. They should understand exactly loosely, or I, maybe not exactly, but they should loosely understand what you do. And the sales calls should be more to figure out the nuances of help me answer some specific questions related to my business or whatever it needs to be. Um, and so I think marketing's role is primarily to do all that hard legwork to get them across the finish line. And so, especially in B2C, marketing is the sales team. There isn't usually a sales team that's telling you to download, you know, Temple Run, Temple Run <laughs> on your phone or, you know, like no, nobody's yeah. convincing you to do that, right? It's, it's yeah. all marketing. So uh, in B2B, I think, marketing sometimes gets a back seat and isn't really seen as important as driving revenue and like getting people to actually buy. But um, I think it should be completely flipped. I think sales is more of the guidance, the helpful piece of like, yeah, let's figure out what's best for you and what's the best way to get the value from this and things like that. And marketing really is the thing that should be driving the entire business. And like me and my partner, Rob, uh, almost half, if not maybe 60% of all of our time is spent on marketing and it makes our sales calls a breeze. People come on, they know exactly what we do, they you know, know why they would need it, when they would need it, and then they basically call us to ask us a couple quick key questions related to something they're doing to make sure that it's the right fit, and then uh, you know, it's, it's, it's usually a pretty easy sale if we've done our job at the marketing side. Hmm. I've heard that on this podcast, the marketing should make sales easier, shorten the sales cycle, all of those. So that is, that's definitely aligned with that process. I really enjoy that kind of, I wouldn't say a simplification of it, but it just really places, but then my mind goes to, and it's obviously what you do well is like, you have to then be able to, in your marketing speak clearly or have a level of clarity that it's like you don't do all these things so then when they do on the call so like how do you think about like marketing's role in that obviously maybe they should own it totally like develop the messaging all of that but like how do you get to like sure your marketing like how do you get to make that sales call easier or just so they hop on and they know right away like what can marketing do or what does marketing do that enables that ideally it all stems from the positioning of the company and the value propositions related to that positioning. And so those questions, those fundamental business questions, they kind of supersede marketing or sales. Usually if it's an earlier stage company, they'll just go straight to the founder or the, the founders. If it's a little bit bigger, sometimes product marketing owns that role. 
And it just varies from from whom actually is the one thinking through those hard questions related to where do we want to compete, who do we want to compete against, how do we want to position ourselves in the market and in the minds of the customers, what are the things we want to actually tell them about our product, all those key messaging pieces. Um, they they really overlap all the different aspects of your business. Um, mm. But sometimes we definitely see that there's not alignment. And if they haven't done that foundational positioning work, you'll end up getting marketing saying one thing, sales is saying something different, customer success is saying something even different than either of them, hmm. which creates a really disjointed experience and, and makes it hard for the for the prospects and eventually the customers to actually understand what the heck it is that you've built, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like a different language. So when you, like in my example or my, my previous or different types of experiences I've had and others that I've hear of, like it seems that for marketing success, it hinges a lot on that. Um, so now you're kind of saying it might be above the market, which makes sense. It's that uh, founder, it's the business. Uh, but like if marketing success kind of hinges on the ability to define the market, how are we going to win in that market or, or whatever? Like how, what would you, what would your um, reaction be if like marketing just tries to own that or starts to realize, hey, maybe marketing is less of a campaign um, order taker in more of this like chief market officer, essentially chief, you know, constructing the market that we play in. Do you see that that's a, a good thing for marketers to kind of quote unquote rise above and have this larger view on like, where does the business really play or should they just quote unquote play in their place and let others decide those things? It's definitely, that's like an organizational question, right? Like what type of system is in place? What type of culture does the company have? Like where there's a vacuum, a strategic mm -hmm. vacuum, Sometimes it can be good for someone to just step up and try to own that. And usually my guess is if that was the case, it would be like more of a passive founder who's like maybe more of a peacemaker, wants to keep everyone happy. And so like there's becomes a vacuum of strategy. And so everyone's sort of like, yeah, well, what do you guys think we should do? <laughs> In those cases, sometimes it can be good to just take the reins. But a lot of times, uh, you know, the vacuum is there for a deep, deep reason that <laughs> might not be able to be circumvented by anyone trying to lead up as they say um, i am actually a big proponent of not leading up and just saying i'm gonna go somewhere else <laughs> because <laughs> i've, I've yes, been in so yes. many organizations where i tried so valiantly to lead up and 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 but like in, in at the end of the day the people at the top are at the top you know and they're gonna do what they want and most of the time if they're going one direction you're not going to change their opinion and if they're going no direction you're not going to get them to start going in direction. So you're almost better off either mm. going somewhere else or doing your own thing, which is why, uh, you know, me and my partner, we left the traditional working world and started our own two person consultancy. So there's no one it. above to, to have to get yeah. annoyed by except myself. <laughs> Yeah, and there's definitely another podcast out there for organizational, you know, all of those issues yeah. or things that come. So I, I enjoy that you point on. I just have this this kind of like yearning and I heard on a different podcast that the, you know, the chief market teen officer, we kind of forget that it's like, what's market? Like, why is it mm -hmm. a market? Okay, it's defining the market. And I think it's very different when you have a CMO. Clearly, they're at the level of C the C-suite. So they have that kind of buy-in. But I think like I default as a marketer to playing in that bigger game versus this small game of just like whatever they tell me. But to your point, if you are getting resistance over and over again, yeah, you're not going to change people's minds if they don't want to. So to your point, find a different environment, better soil to grow in. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I enjoy that. What is something in marketing in the last one to two years that you've changed your mind on? So you believed X maybe in 2021 or 2020 before COVID and now out of COVID you're believing Y. Does anything pop to your mind? Yeah, I think um, I, w I don't know if I would say I vastly changed my mind like a full sale, you know, wholesale p pivot, but I definitely have like realized the value of pieces of marketing that like something that I thought was just over in the corner actually is like a cornerstone of literally everything. It's who you're choosing to go after, what segment of people makes the largest difference of every single aspect of your product strategy, your go-to-market strategy, whatever it is. And the who, choosing a who that is specific and uh, not just like a firmographic, well, we're going after large businesses, you know, with X amount of revenue and X amount of employees. That's not actually a segment. That's just like a firmographic group. So to become a market segment, you have to really get specific on what's their, what are they actually trying to do? What are they like what in using the jobs to be done language, like what job are they trying to accomplish? 
What are the current ways that they do these things? And then what are the problems that result from it? Because if you don't have those aspects, you can't actually ever penetrate a market. And so for me, the importance of segmentation of like, this is a real segment and the power that I've seen of going incredibly specific on a segment, which increases the penetration into that segment versus going broad and just getting a little bit of traction across 10 different segments versus just going after one and really dominating it. And so for me, I've, I've learned the value of, of niching down, of focusing. Um, and that's not just in the services world, like with us, but with, with even with startups, they call it like the bowling pin strategy, hyper-focused on the first segment, which is smaller and using the success in dominating that segment to then knock down the two pins behind it, the four pins behind those, and then expanding. Or like uh, the other analogy that they use is like in World War II, they had to take Normandy first to be able to get to the rest of the countries. So you have to start with that beachhead to be able to penetrate. And so I'm a huge believer in that. And I think that there's a alternate way of doing marketing uh, and just approaching markets in general, which is we're trying to be, go from zero to a billion just like that. Like we're not going to try to, you know, t do the beachhead strategy or the bowling pin or whatever. We're just going to try to do that. And to me, it feels like you're just sort of like covering your eyes and buying the lottery ticket, you know, like it, maybe it'll work for us. We don't know how. Um, and they can, you know, people can point to all sorts of companies. Well, this company just did that. And well, what about, and they're always, they always talk about these companies with these incredible virality mechanisms that just spread them throughout the world for them. And I always ask, I'm like, so do you have some sort of <laughs> secret viral tactic that's going to get you? And they're like, well, no. I'm like, how do you acquire your customers? <laughs> well, traditional marketing and sales. And I'm like, okay, so you got 25 different segments you're going after. How many marketing sales people? <laughs> well, we got two AEs. We got one marketer part-time. We use a freelancer. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so you think that's going to work? <laughs> and so, but, but, but then it's just like this. It's like just, you know, well, it might be. And then they'll just buy, they got the lottery ticket in one hand. Yeah. And they're just trying to, you know. So, so I think for me, that's been the biggest learning is like the importance of specificity, really defining an actual real segment across all those different variables. It's just so underappreciated in, in most modern discussions around startups. Hmm. So aside from the fact of like, why don't more people work out because they're lazy? Like, why don't more people do that? Why do more people just struggle with the kind of lottery tick, lottery ticket strategy? What have you seen? It's a couple of different things. It's mainly to my perspective, it's, it's venture capital is kind of the culprit and it's lack of understanding of marketing as these from these founders. So like, the, the, the archetypal founding team is a builder and a seller. It's like, a, you know, the technical person and then the strong, charismatic uh, sales related person who's selling the vision to investors, selling the visions to customers. No marketer. And they're always thinking, when do we hire our first marketing hire? That's always the question. And they don't usually hire a CMO because that's like, yeah, it seems premature. So they hire a, a doer, an executor, you know, someone good with content marketing or something like that. And then the VCs, they, I think there was a stat from um, Emily Kramer, who's a, she's great, but she said, um, I think 1% of venture capitalists have marketing in their background. So you have this whole ecosystem wow. where no one is thinking about marketing. They don't understand it. They don't really get like from, how do you go from nothing to a billion dollar company? It's just sort of like a, a cloudy white space in the middle. You know, like they love the, fa the stories where it's like they started in the garage and then now they're a billion dollar company. But all the stuff that happens in between, it's like a little hazy. Yeah. And then the VCs are like, well, I'm, I'm just betting on the team. You know, they'll figure it out. I don't have to figure that out. They'll figure it out. And the team is like, you know, we're the VCs want us to have a billion dollar market. Let's just go after the, the whole TAM all at once. So to me, those are the main culprits of it. No, that's very interesting. As always, a lot of forces, right? Pulling and, and things that can make it. But I think that stat's very interesting. I do think uh, marketing, yeah, isn't fully um, shown at, at the table, quote unquote, in some of those. And then that has that. Uh, because I think a lot of marketing too is mindset. So it's like, sure, you can know how to create a video or whatever. Uh, but the people that are through marketing, fundament like that have done marketing, hopefully have the fundamentals. And that, I think leads conversation contrarian points of view that you just can't get to sometimes without uh that background um which is is an interesting thing not being in the startup world that stat was new to me but wow that is that's a, that's pretty insane mm -hmm. and i think a lot of people too conflate marketing with like marketing tactics 
like, oh, marketing. Well, that's like how to run an email campaign, right? Oh, well, that's like how to, what should I post on LinkedIn? Where it's like marketing is the foundation of the business. Like it's the core, what markers are we going to play in like you were describing before? And so for me, like when I first started understanding how marketing really works, it felt like I was in the matrix. And at the <laughs> end when Neo can see all the code and he's like, oh, I see how everything works. And now like, especially since we've worked with, you know, over a hundred companies at this point with their messaging and their positioning, it's like, I can, I can look at someone's website and know exactly why they wrote what they wrote and why it's so bad and where it's going to screw them over in the future. Just because it's like, it's a core funding, like foundational product, product marketing and marketing principles, just like missing, you know? And it's like, you, you have, so, so I, like a, even a smaller soapbox of mine is like, I actually, the concept of an ICP, an ideal customer profile, it's like, man, if we could get a bunch of this one group, we would really kill it. I actually think in startup world, I think people say that they think that's good, but I think in practice, they reveal most founders don't even think ICP is a good concept because choosing one group in their minds will never be as big as choosing all groups. So if they're like, if I need to be a billion dollar company, I can't have an ideal customer profile. I need 50. <laughs> so we'll add, we'll say when we get on calls with founders, we'll say, who's your, who's your ICP? Who's your, and they'll say, yeah, yeah, we've really got it. We've really got to nail down. It's these five industries uh, across these, you know, from startups to enter. And I'm like, you're just describing like a thousand different segments. <laughs> like, well, yeah, that's how we're going to get to be a billion dollar company. You know, we're going to, we're going to take them all at once. So that's, that's a little bit of a soapbox yeah. of mine. I actually don't think anyone believes in ICP anymore. Hmm. Wow. That's, that's a super unique kind of point. And the fact that if you don't believe in that, then yeah, you will have a lot of ICPs. I do like your point of the, about the difference between marketing and marketing tactics. That's a reason why this podcast is mainly stays in that theory fundamental stage. I don't, we won't get into many times like email, uh, kind of drip campaigns or all those things because yeah. yes, they're, they're effective, but, um, without the fundamentals, you're building on poor scaffolding. So that's why I love that you mentioned that I'll use that as a testimonial for my podcast. So Crazy. jump in. Jumping in, Anthony, to really what you and your partner have done really well is website messaging, that positioning. So, like, before you tell us how to do it, and, and you probably um, could through this, but, like, what, what gets in the way? Like, what stops people from nailing their messaging? I mean, clearly we've talked about some of the things, but how would you distill that? Like, what gets in the way of good messaging on a website or just in marketing in general? I think, and I'm, I'm going to get a little, a little deep for a second. So, Please. in a former life... I was actually, I worked for a lot of different churches and I started in like a low level production running the soundboard and, you know, sometimes being in the band and stuff like that. And then I was in the communications and I actually ended up going all the way to being a pastor. So not many people know that, uh, but I was, I was actually a pastor for a couple of years and then left that world, came into tech. And so it's funny, a lot of like the deeper human condition stuff that I used to talk about on a weekly basis it, it, the thread of it has come back and I'm like so many of these problems that I see of why someone something as trivial as like the website message is not very clear. A lot of it actually traces back to like core things about what it means to be a human and the way that we hmm. like have deficiencies in our personalities. And and so like just to, like I'll give you one example. I think that as a company gets larger the executives at the the high level that when given the choice would i rather have someone think that we do less than we actually do like look at our website and we give them a couple examples and it's like we actually do a hundred things but if we only talk about two or three they're gonna not think that we're as amazing as we really are three out of a hundred versus like you know they're like but when given the choice between that and then people not knowing anything that they do like just a pure 100 percent mystery i think a lot of executives will pick the second option i would rather have people have no idea of what i do versus think lesser of what i've created and i think it comes i honestly think it comes from deep pride and ego of of people who have worked their way up have climbed the ladder and have become and so it's like it's the whole like i'm i'm desperately trying to justify my existence i'm trying to show these amazing things and the pride and the ego make it so they can't ever reduce the scope of what their grandeur is to a level that would allow people to actually buy it. 
which is so ironic. Normally, you wouldn't like as associate humility with like driving more sales. You know, you'd be like, oh, it's got to be the most pride. But like, if you actually look at the most customer centric way of messaging, it's taking everything you could possibly offer and hiding it vert like like temporarily taking all the amazing things you can offer and just putting it to the side and saying let me just help you with one little piece of your life first and once i've helped you in that way then we can talk about we can start showing you other things that you could get it's very similar to like a dating relationship it's like someone coming to the other person and being like i need you to understand everything i can offer i'm going to be a great father to your children i'm going to be a great person with you in your old age I want to marry you. I want, you know, like it's so overwhelming for the person on the other side. And they're like, you need to know everything that I'm going to give you and all the value. And, and they're like, we just met. This is <laughs> too much. Um, or like, you know, um, another example, like, you know, being like, I need people. Like if someone says, well, what do you do for a living? But, you know, like a humble person will just say like a little snippet, you know, like, well, I, I, I work in software, right? Or I do marketing. But like the person who's like, I need to tell you all of my accomplishments. You need to know what I've done. So these are like these core human level issues end up getting in the way. And it's how you end up with these insanely vague, like make make us find, seem really cool and amazing, like driving innovation for the next generation of modern business. Like that's how you get there. It's It's just people appealing to the egos of the executives rather than trying to think what would a real human buying our services what would help them to to understand what they're going to get right so uh I, didn't, I don't mean to go too deep but like the more i see it it's less of like a oh they just need to tweak this tactic and it's like it truly is like an issue of the human soul or something that's yeah. causing most of these problems oh i love that you bring that up anthony because i always had this kind of thought that life, the virtues, the things that we value in life intersect with marketing, intersect with business. And I think that's so true because many times it's it's hard to, if you are the product, if you are the company, if you have not created the disassociation that it's a product, it's not me, then yes, by diminishing it, you are diminishing yourself, which is a huge, tough thing to do. So I think that is so profound and to really think like if I'm having struggling, if I'm struggling with messaging or some of these things, is it a tactic I need or is it, you know, maybe not a therapist, but just some reflection and some deep um, introspection on my own uh, inefficiencies or ego or things like that. That's that's profound. And I enjoy to hear that you came from uh, as a pastor, just from that world. I um, am a follower of Christ. So I, it's something that I've dug deep into and it's been amazing to me. A lot of the things of like treating people with respect and just basic yeah. things. It's like, this is good marketing too. Like, wow, I should have, you know, maybe went to uh, whatever school for, for that um, to become yeah. a pastor because I could have probably become a better marketer than just taking these business classes that focus on tactics or kind of slimy for sure. ways. I love that. I've never, I've never heard that. So, so I guess aside from, you know, overcoming your ego and putting pride to the side, which is a lifelong journey, at least for me, what are some other ways or just supplemental ways people can start to do things to get clear on their messaging, whether it's an action, whether it's testing it with people, what are some things that you've done or you uh, think are quick ways to start to get clearer on your messaging? The biggest shift comes from kind of like a misapplied advice that we see everywhere is focus on outcomes like that's 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 the the advice and it's because for some reason people in software forget that they're selling a product which sounds silly but like everywhere else in the world you're like i have created this thing and i'm gonna package it and i'm gonna sell it to you and you're gonna give me money for it but software we're like no 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 people aren't buying products they're buying outcomes so you go to the you go to the out the outcome store and you're shopping around well i need a 10 percent boost in roi do you have that <laughs> Do you have that? Like they literally think that that's what these people are shopping, how they shop. I'm looking for an outcome. I want I want to make a meme of uh the the part in the Wolf of Wall Street movie where he says sell me this pen, but I want to I want to see if I can get with AI to where it's Leonardo DiCaprio just with an empty hand, sell me this outcome. That's <laughs> that's literally what they're they're doing. So when you take that, you apply that and every single startup and every single growth stage startup 
on their website it's just outcomes it's outcome after outcome after outcome boost your you know get more leads boost your conversion rate close more deals shorten sales cycles and then you go down and it's like here's how different teams are using it marketers are using it to increase conversions sales are and i'm like wait a minute we never said what it is what do they what do we do with it and you go down and at the end of the page, there's a million outcomes and you never ever explained what it does, how it works, how you use it, when you use it, any of those foundational questions where in a physical product world, you can show outcomes because the product's in front of you, like I'm looking at it, right? But mm -hmm. most of the software companies won't even put their product on the, on the page anywhere. If anything, they'll just do like these weird, very cool looking illustrations. Maybe those like for a little while they were doing those tall cartoon, like different, <laughs> like green person, like, you know, all long looking. Yep. And so no product to be seen and just a list of outcomes. And they expect you that you're going to be like, well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm shopping for that outcome. So I'll for sure buy it. I'll buy 100% ROI. Like <laughs> how much, where do I pay? Yeah. But the, the biggest shift that we've seen is if you shift from not necessarily just talking about features, but we call, the cap we call it a capability, which is what do I do with it? How do, how do I use it? Um, what do I use the product to do? So like a capability with Slack, a common app that we all use, right? Like communicate with all your team members like in one shared channel. The communicate with all your team members, that's, that's an action. I could point to you at 2 p.m. I was using that product capability. I was on the screen. I was typing in the box. I was in the channel. Um, and the outcome would be like, you know, something like, so you save time from having to send emails or some, some sort of outcome. But it, the, talking about it at the capability level just makes everything so much clearer. So like most of the work we do with companies when we're helping them rewrite their website, it's just taking all the outcomes and being like, how do you achieve that outcome? And they'll be like, you know, it'll usually take four or five rounds of this. They'll be like, well, yeah, you close more sales. And I'm like, well, how do, how do you achieve that? And they're like, well, you know, you reduce this amount of time or whatever. And I'm like, well, how do you do that? And they just keep going outcome, outcome. And then eventually we'll get to bedrock and it'll be actually the product. And they'll be like, you send messages to other people. I'm like, there we are. That's what <laughs> That's you had it. to say, right? Not, okay, <laughs> now we got 25 outcomes and we finally got to the, what do I actually do when I log into it? Um, and I'll even ask the question, I'll be like, when would someone log in? Like it's, it's you know, 9 a.m. On a, on a Monday morning, they go to your website, they open up the app. What are they doing? I'm like, well, they're really trying to, you know, de decrease. And I'm like, no, no, no. What are they <laughs> doing? What's the activity? <laughs> and eventually we can get them there. And then usually when you just make that switch from benefits, outcomes into capabilities, it gets a lot better. Hmm. So capabilities, as you talked about, includes actions. It also, as you talked about, includes a when, which leads into my next thing that I, I really love what you talk about, use cases and all that, like context. Is that very important for you when you're thinking of messaging and that of the context they use it in? Or can you elaborate on how you use context to strengthen messaging or create messaging? A hundred percent. Yeah. So the, the context piece is is what sets everything, right? Like if I if you said explain to me when you would use Figma, the design program, the context, who am I talking to? Am I explaining it to a product designer? Am I explaining it to an engineer or a product manager, or I'm explaining to someone outside of tech, the context of each different group, what they're actually trying to do in that moment is going to set it. It's going to set the expectations of which features I highlight, which ones I don't highlight. Right. And because that's, there's a whole side of Figma that's all about de for developers. It's like developer mode. You can see all the specific specifications that they'll use to create this in code. If I'm explaining Figma, like I, I, uh, we work with a copywriter who, who was not familiar with Figma when we first started working with her. So we've taught her a lot, a lot of Figma as it's gone. I've never even mentioned that part of the platform. And I probably never will because I'm like, hmm. I don't want to burden you with stuff that is so outside of your context, what you're actually trying to do. Which comes, like, comes back to that foundational piece that I said earlier. Picking a who, choosing a segment that you're actually trying to reach is going to help answer so many questions. Because if you get specific on that who, you could say, what's the context that they're in? What are they trying to do? Which will allow you to make all sorts of good trade-offs of, we won't talk about this. We're going to talk about this because that's really applicable to what they're trying to do. Hmm. So the who leads the, the context or the when or those types of, hmm, that makes a lot of sense. And there is, there is a, a group, like you can create segmentation based on the, the use case itself, the context. Like you can say, uh, I, I didn't come up with this. It was in some jobs to be done book, but they were like, your grandma living in Florida could have the exact same use case of someone who's living in the mountains 
you know, like in Denver or something like that. Like they can both be trying to increase their internet speed, right? Like mm. installing a router to make their internet faster. Like, so you can have use case based segmentation where it is like a shared context that's by lots of different people. So it doesn't always have to be like, we start with marketing directors and then we talk about what are they trying to do. Um, but the context is so important for setting your anchor point for all your value propositions for positioning. What are you positioning against? It's all directly related to to the who and the context. Hmm. Who plus context. I love that. Now you you talking about the the outcomes. I really enjoy that kind of contrarian uh, point because yeah, I do see a lot of outcomes that it's just like I, I don't even know what you do. But how do you with the jobs you've done? I'm very uh, very kind of novice in it, but I know of the progress and I know there are like outcome driven different. You know, there's like two different schools of thought on it. But how do you see outcomes in progress? Because sometimes like progress is or is progress more defined because it's like I want to make my room more homely where that that's not an outcome, but it's not a capability or how do you think about progress with capabilities and outcomes? We see them as we like there's orders of, of, of like they sequence into each other. So like we, we would say the first order benefit or the first order outcome is what happens like temporally, like sequence wise when I enact this capabilities, what's the first thing that happens? So when a team adopts Asana, the project management tool, the first outcome is we're gonna be a little more organized. Like everyone gets their tasks in, and so we're more organized than we were before. A second order outcome of being more organized is we might get more tasks done. If we, if we know where they all are, we'll get more tasks done. A third order benefit or third order outcome might be if we get more things done, we can ship more features than we did before. If we ship more features, fourth order, I already lost count where I was, but you know, fourth order outcome, if we ship more features, maybe customers are more satisfied. If mm. customers are more satisfied, then they're going to maybe tell other people more. If they tell other people more, then maybe we're going to get more users. If we get more users, then we're going to get more revenue. So like the progress piece, it's all a sliding scale. It's like one thing cascades into the other one. So your first order and second order benefits are usually the differentiated value that you provide. They're the things that are unique to what your tool does. And as you keep cascading down the line, you just get to things that are undifferentiated, right? Get more customers, drive more sales, boost your revenue. Like that could be shared by 50 different tools in 50 different product categories. But when you go back to the first order thing, right? Like uh, we use, um, we use a, a, an app called Shield to tell us specifically like how we're doing in terms of our LinkedIn followers. So like the first order outcome would be like, you know, know if you're getting more LinkedIn followers this month than last month. And then I could, I could keep cascading that out of like get better visibility and if we're growing or not, you know, have better confidence in our data. Like, and so we get further, <laughs> further away and it, it no longer is differentiated and specific yeah. to what that company actually does where when you talk about the first order one, so a lot of like the progress stuff that we're talking about, like the whole, like uh, the famous jobs we done thing is, people aren't buying a quarter inch drill, they're trying to buy a quarter inch hole. And then I've seen a couple of people make the joke, they're like, but they're not really buying a quarter inch hole. They're trying to buy a photo that they're gonna hang on it, but they're not actually buying the, the hanging, the, they're trying to buy a, you know, a meaningful experience with their family in the sense, and they, you could just keep going into nonsense, right? So hmm. we go the opposite way, rather than trying to ladder up until you're like, you know, find love by <laughs> this drill, you know? Yeah. Uh, getting back to the differentiated piece of like, how do I use it? What are my capabilities oh, and features? Yeah. And then what's the first order benefit, right? The hole's yeah. gonna be, I don't know, the straightest hole you've ever seen or something yeah. like that. Yeah. That's where it really actually makes sense to the people who are trying to buy it. Like we were shopping for a um, blender and I'm like, the blender we have now is not very strong. So it doesn't, it gets stuck and doesn't cut through the ice. So I'm like, the outcome I'm looking for <laughs> is one that will chop the ice. I'm not looking for, you know, feel fulfillment and <laughs> deep, you know, satisfaction in who I am as a human. I'm looking for ice chopped. And if I see one that's like, we're the strongest one on the market, we'll chop any ice you throw at us. That's the one I'm buying. Yes. Hmm. I love that. So what maybe you're saying is a lot of the companies start at that aspirational level, that very high up, like with the drill, you know, we're going to get you laid because you'll have a cool room that then the woman <laughs> like, it's like, wait a second, I well, hold up here. I'm just trying to get that quarterage. Like, I love yes. that. that. That's beautiful. That Because uh, I've had a lot of 
enjoyment in that analogy where you can start to think differently of like, okay, you aren't really selling the nail, but you are kind of, but it's this, yeah. and I've enjoyed the way that you just kind of explained it was, uh, was helpful in adding on to it. But I think I've learned a ton. I know the two to three people listening have, so I'm ready to jump into the hot seat. If you are, it's going to get a little bit sweaty. Um, uh, maybe, uh, no, it won't get too sweaty, but are you, are you ready to jump into the hot seat? Yeah, let's try it. All right. This is the first time. Season two is the first time I've done it. So uh, this may not even make it. No, I'm just kidding. I'll put everything in. <laughs> All right. So we'll start with some verse questions. Try to answer as quick as possible. But clearly, if there's something you want to elaborate on, you know, feel feel free to do that. For sure. Uh, so uh, what's more effective for startups in engaging their target audience? Focus messaging or broad messaging? 100% focused. <laughs> not, not even a question. <laughs> Uh, which holds more weight for a startup's initial growth, kind of nailing the website messaging or focusing on social media engagement, if you had to choose one? If I had to choose one, I would go social media first, only because I would use that to drive what I put on the website. That's exactly what we did. We we spent a decent amount of time just putting out content before we even made the website mm. to figure out exactly where we should we should focus our energy and our time. And then that allowed us to say, okay, it's this segment. We're going deep on them. Yeah, gave you more feedback than just throwing a website together and having 10 visitors. Yeah, I like that. W would you rather choose in-house messaging development or outsourcing to experts? Obviously a little bit bias on this, but where would you land on that? If you have product marketing muscles on your team, do it yourself. If you don't have those muscles, you're probably too, ir or too early to hire a product marketer full-time. Um, you probably would want more of a generalist. So Find someone who can help you with that. And even if it's you just learning it, reading books, you know, follow our stuff on LinkedIn, any of that stuff can get you going. But yeah, someone has to figure that out. And if you don't want to devote the time to learning how to do messaging, then I would say outsource. Hmm, I like that answer. For growth or just building an engaged community, would you rather choose email newsletters or social media? Again, I would do social media. I think the email newsletter doesn't have any distribution built in. You still have to find a way to get those followers. So I, I, we have not yet started a newsletter and me and Robert have both, you know, gained close to 36, 37,000 followers a piece. So to me, it's like when we do eventually turn on something like a newsletter, we'll have already created the audience and it'll be easier to get followers. But using a newsletter or a podcast as the growth mechanism is really hard because there's no like nobody swiping through newsletters, you know, like you would on <laughs> like social media, right? There's no yeah. just newsletter directory. Yeah, virality is almost impossible with a newsletter. A podcast a little different because it would be easier shared on. Like Joe Rogan interviewed this person. Yeah, and it, yeah. But again, I'm not Joe Rogan, so no, I love that. That's really good. <laughs> uh, final, final verse question: If you had, what has had a more significant impact on your career, mentorship or self learning? Mm, I'm going to choose a third option that you didn't say. Please. I'm going to say it's actually like having someone who's in the trenches at the same level. Both of you doing the same things together like me and my partner robert working together this last you know couple of years has advanced my career you know and and learning way more than ever a self-learning piece because you lose the momentum or a mentor who's like kind of removed from it so having that person at the same level i think is the, is probably the best hmm. best of both worlds kind mm -hmm. of you get both learning together and some level of mentorship that you both give each other oh, i love that all right now we're jumping into yes or no questions can you have good messaging with poor positioning? Oh, that's such a good question. Uh, I would say, man, that one, I remember you sent that over and I thought, I got to really think through that so I can give a really thoughtful answer <laughs> that I never did. I think I'm going to say yes. But uh, I, I am very hesitant about that. And I think it's rare. I love it. Is a consistent messaging strategy across all platforms crucial for brand recognition or just growing the brand? Do you need to kind of tweak it for every single platform or can you use a one size fits all messaging? If you want to get really good penetration and I used to say yes or no, I would, I would have it be consistent. So my answer would be yes. to. <laughs> Does engaging with a diverse audience require a fundamental change in messaging strategy? So if you're going to go to a new um, set of audience, do you need to change that messaging? Yes, 100%. This is a little bit off wall, but is SEO is kind of getting good at SEO is still a valuable skill for people nowadays. Depending on the company and the product. Yes. Hmm, I like that. All right. This is where you can go a little bit deeper. These are going to be open ended questions. What's one mental model you use for growing your social media presence? I always ask what would make LinkedIn happiest, the company, what would oh. they like 
me to make them and then I make the content for them. And then <laughs> that usually ends up working. Ah, and, and that's kind of opposed to what some people would say, make it for the audience because really the platform controls like what the audience the sees. Is that does, the... Yeah, exactly. So like when we think about it, like we're still thinking about the audience, but our first, our first, like we're paying tribute to the distribution system. <laughs> Lord LinkedIn. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Lord LinkedIn. And uh, the, their, because their algorithm is funneling every part of our go to market. So I'm like, if I want my message to get seen by as many people as possible, what would LinkedIn like? Well, LinkedIn hmm. is trying to have a platform where you learn a lot. Um, people find like they go on, they get deep, helpful tips. It's not spammy. It's not salesy. So we like, all right, let's write huge guides with really in-depth uh, diagrams, long write-ups, no calls to action, no follow me on this, check out because salesy stuff. And then the LinkedIn algorithm's like, great, we'll we'll promote this to tons and tons of people. <laughs> And then, I you know, that. so, so, and they changed their algorithm. So like they recently changed it and we had to say, okay, they don't really like us anymore. What we were doing, we got to change what we're doing now or else mm. we're going to, we're going to no longer reach the people that we need to reach. Yeah. That's smart. Being quite responsive to the platform. Yeah. No, I like that. What's a book or resource that has significantly influenced or helped your approach to positioning messaging? Um, and you can't say April Dunford's book either. For sure. I would say crossing the chasm by Jeffrey Moore has been probably the biggest one. That's like all around the beachhead strategy, um, going really specific, finding the underserved group of people, getting them first, and then spreading from there. Uh, so I think that for anyone who's just getting into this type of stuff, I usually recommend that book first. Mm, I thought that's where the Normandy, because uh, when you brought that up, I, I recalled it, but I was like, how do I know that? Um, yeah, awesome. it's in there. Awesome, okay. What's a most? What's one of the most counterintuitive uh, advice you've given to a startup regarding web, website messaging? So you've clearly shared a lot of your best practices, but what's something that you advise that wouldn't fit in some of the things you said today? Yeah, I mean, th this will still kind of fit, but it feels kind of intuitive is like when you're an early stage startup, you should actually, if you had to lean one way more than the other, I would lean towards showing too many features rather than no features. Because uh, the pendulum has swung so far the other way where people don't have any features at all and don't explain anything. And I, like, mm -hmm. if I was going to look at two pages, I would rather be inundated with a wall of features than at a wall of outcomes. Because at least <laughs> at least here I have a chance. There's yeah. a chance I could parse through the features <laughs> to find what I'm looking for. But here, there's no chance at all. Yes. Oh, I like that. that. That makes a lot of sense. What's a common mistake you see people make on social media when marketing, when creating content that you either just cringe at or it's like, oh, I wish they would do it differently? too broad, too vague. Not everyone can be Malcolm Gladwell. You know, not everyone could be Simon Sinek who does these, you know, fortune cookie posts. That are just like, <laughs> so I, I always see people posting stuff like this and I'm like, who is this for? You know what I mean? yeah. like some fictional, like gray human who's an amalgamation of every possible, you know, so, so like, not being specific enough like the platforms love specificity the the algorithm is so good at feeding if you give it specific inputs it will send them to the right people who are looking for that exact thing so like the the more specific and niche we go the more our impressions go through the roof like rob rob's most viral post was if you're a startup here's like loosely what you should put on each of your four or five different page types it was seen by like a million and a half people and it was like such a specific post, like with really detailed stuff, like didn't apply to 99% of the people on the whole platform. But LinkedIn was like, this is super helpful. And that group of people is maybe 5 million people. So we're going to show it to at least a fifth of them. Wow. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. What's... um. Now, you know, I, I can't. I'm just going to end on that. That was a good point. Now we're going to jump into kind of the life segment, as we talked about a little bit earlier. I think that leads into it. So there's this movie called Inception. Leonardo DiCaprio goes into people's brains, incepts ideas in their dreams. They wake up the next day that they think that idea is theirs. So what idea would you go into the minds of all marketers, all product marketers and incept? So tomorrow, maybe Monday, they wake up and they just act out of that belief, that idea as their own. But you get to watch joyfully as people start to act more in the way that you think is beneficial for them? I think it would be, I mean, very similar to a lot of the stuff that I said, but I think it would be, I would incept the idea, you are selling a product and for people to buy the product, they have to understand the product. And so you should try to explain to potential customers, what is the product that you've created? And it feels, if I said that to someone outside of SaaS marketing, it would be insulting to their intelligence. They'd be like, I, like, it wouldn't would even be worth saying because of how painfully <laughs> obvious it is. And yet it's like taboo 
in the whole industry of, of SaaS to be like, wait a minute, you're telling me that I should explain the product <laughs> I built? And it, it goes back for all those reasons we've mentioned, but that's yeah. what I would accept. Mm, I love that. What is a value or a belief that you think needs more focus and attention in today's time? So maybe for me, it's discipline. I don't think that's getting um, enough a spotlight. What is a virtue? What is a value or a belief that you think needs more focus? I think I would say probably self self learning, like really being fueled by learning things and and having the self discovery process of wanting to learn new skills. Like a couple of my close friends, even since we were little, we would always be learning new you know programs and and new new different techniques about things. And it just is such an intrinsically motivating piece. And I think so many people are like, if no one told me to do this, if no one told me to to go learn this program, why would I spend my time doing something like that? Like that's unpaid labor where it's like, no, 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 no. Every single tool you learn is going to help you at some level down the line. And so having, having that view of the world of like knowledge is like a, a fuel for how you do things. Like even, even earlier today, like I posted something on LinkedIn yesterday and I was in jumping into Photoshop. I'm pulling things, you know, in Figma I'm doing, and I'm like pulling from all these different areas of my life of, of skills I've learned in the past. And I'm like, see, it wasn't a waste of time to learn these kind of things for fun. And they've actually helped me even in vastly different parts of my career. And so just viewing learning in that way that like when I learn new skills, they don't have to directly apply in the exact job that I'm in now. They likely will help in the long term either way. Mm, I love that. How have you cultivated curiosity? I mean, it seems as your example, you had it from a young age. Maybe I fit into that too. But how would you go about cultivating curiosity? I mean, some of the things like, you know, be okay at sucking and having the outcome be terrible because you're learning. Like, what are other things you may um, provide to someone that wants to be more, more curious, aka learning as like a, a virtue that they have? Yeah, I think I think it's like a mindset shift that and and realizing that in 2023, with so much time and energy going into making programs as easy as possible to learn, like it has never had a lower barrier to entry to almost anything, right? Like a friend of mine, he got really into 3D animating. So he's learning all these crazy programs. And, and he's like, he's like, there are, he's like, imagine doing this 20 years ago, pre YouTube. Like I can literally just watch a video and there's someone passionately explaining how to do something. So like giving yourself the permission, like you said, to be not very good at it at first. And then just remembering like, it's never been easier to pick up a new skill. And we have never had more access to resources for free than any other generation in, in human history. Yeah, no, I think that that's a crazy thing. Do you have a filter of when you don't? So for me, for example, I know video editing, I know a lot of that, but animation I've never gone deep into because I've realized that to get to the bar of a Nike animation or Adidas animation or whichever, uh, it, it takes a very long time and you need to almost be like a specialist in that. And maybe since three years ago that I was in um, Photoshop, uh, and I forget, or not uh, Adobe. Yeah, like it just seems to be still for me, even as a Premiere Pro editor, like it was a, just a bar that it was like, I'm going to have to spend five, 10 years to get to a level of proficiency. So do you have a filter for even as someone curious where it's like, hey, I'll outsource this or I'll just eventually like, how do you think through that? Or is it different every time? I think it's different every time. Um, and I will tell you the animating is like, I've done some like basic animating and stuff and learned some of the principles and it is not a 10 year thing. Like I, okay. the one area where I think this actually doesn't apply is like software development. Like when I talk to software developers, I'm like, I'm like, I can't even, I, I had one guy just trying to explain to me like what was on his screen and we talked <laughs> for about an hour and I, I didn't retain any of it. And I don't, and I'm like, it really does feel like it would take, you know, five years <laughs> before you could even write one usable line of code. But this could be even me falling into the same trap, like the way you're thinking about animating. You know, maybe I, maybe it is easier than I'm imagining it. But uh, I think for the most part, most things that aren't like becoming a doctor or a lawyer or a <laughs> you know, biochemist or something, they, I think the, the learning curve is a lot lower. Yeah, rocket scientists might be. Yeah, exactly. Too. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I like that, and that's that's cool. How we both maybe that's I guess the human condition is we are always blind to things that maybe I could invest more time in and it could quickly get good at it, but I'm just scared of it or whichever. For sure. I like that. Um, what is one habit or practice or thing you do outside of business, marketing product that you come back to it and you're just more refined and you can do it better? Yeah, I think um, I, reading is like I spend a lot of time reading and. I think a, a big accelerant of reading is when I started reading on Kindle on my phone. So some people are like, oh, I would hate that. But you get used to it. And then any time, like if, if say you just take off your social media apps off your phone 
and you replace it with the Kindle app, like every single time throughout the day that you would open Instagram or TikTok or whatever, if you just pop open that Kindle app, you can fly through books and you can get a ton of them. And, and a lot of these things now too, like it's just automatically audio is available. So you can just flip over to that if you're, you know, walking somewhere and you can't like be reading. But I think, I think reading has been the biggest accelerant um, for, for all of my learning. Yeah, I, I second that. I had like a thing of reading 40 books a year for like mm -hmm. the last five or six years. And it That's just, great. it's impossible to go back to Jordan five years ago without the 200 books. Like it just yeah. does things to you no matter what. And even the pushback of like, well, reading is more like a slow method. So you retain it. It's like, even if I read a book, I retain like two things from it. But I keep the book so then I can go back to it. So I think audio reading, it's all very beneficial. And I think anybody who wants to argue those is um, just in there isn't sure. in a good place. But what final question with AI, with all these things, so many things are changing. I want to ask you, what is one thing you hope doesn't change in the next 10 to 15 years? What is something that we either have today or maybe we had a few years ago that you just hope stays around to make humanity, to make everything we're doing a little bit better and easier? When AI came onto the scene, everyone's first initial reaction was, this is going to be so great. We're going to be able to automate content creation. And I'm like, that is the one thing that is like so interesting and cool is like the things that people are creating and sharing. Like <laughs> the last thing I want to like just give up to the AI. So like even even we use AI, I use AI every day. I have, I have ChatGPT open every single day and I'm using it 10, 15 times a day. Um, and now I use it for a lot for content creation, but it's to fuel the content creation process, not to replace it. So I'm really hoping that with all the AI advancements and stuff, that it's still a human pushing out a human idea aided by technology to make it easier or faster or whatever. Um, but that is the thing that I really hope we don't lose. And I actually don't think we're going to lose it. I think even if people all switch to LLMs and stuff, I think the humans are going to be the ones who actually win in the content race because it's, I just don't think it can compete still. Hmm. I love that. Yeah. I think a core thing of humans is observation or finding the insight, seeing the material that then goes into the joke, the content, whatever. So I think, yes, AI could, if you're like a comedian, come up with a hundred different kind of like starts of jokes, but really it's that ability as a human to see two people across the street talking and something happens in that interaction that then sparks something that then you can go create a joke off of. I, I find AI, I mean, until it gets to consciousness, it it, it yeah. struggles to, out, I will never outsource my observing. I think that's always for the human in that AI can kind of, as I use it, I use it to poke holes in my arguments. I use it to kind of say, where do I need to strengthen this essay? That's where I find value as you were kind of talking about, but having to replace, I also really hope that doesn't turn into our future because yeah. um, I just love, yeah, human content and the ideas, ran, people, the random ideas are so fun to engage with at times, but I love for that. Sure. Well, thank you, Anthony. This uh, this was so much fun. I learned a ton, and I know the few listeners definitely did as well. Thank you for coming on, man. I appreciate it. Definitely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and this is the end of the podcast. Thank you for making it to the end. It means the world to me that you watch or you listen to this episode, and hopefully you're walking away with new insights to improve how you think about marketing and life and help you make progress on what matters to you. But one thing before you go, if you could subscribe wherever you're listening to this or watching, that would really help out both you getting the episodes right when they come out and raising this podcast in the ranking. So hopefully more people like you can listen to this. And if there's anything that I can do to make this podcast more beneficial for you, if it's somebody you think I should interview, if you're the person, please comment, please email me. It's in the show notes so we can just continually deliver more value to you, the listener. Again, thank you for watching and have a great rest of your day, evening, week, and hope to see you here next time.